finishing up chapter one. Right? Last class we were talking about elements, we were talking about molecules, we were talking about atoms, and we were talking about compounds, right? So let's start with atoms, right? What are atoms? Smallest element. The smallest unit of matter that has the properties of that type of matter. Everybody comfortable with that? Cool. Um, what is a molecule? That's right, a combination of two or more atoms, right? Uh, do those atoms have to be the same flavor? No. No, right? They can be the mm -hmm. same. Is everybody comfortable with what I mean by flavor? Yeah. I'm just talking about different, different um, flavors of atoms, right? Different types of atoms. So, uh, can an element be an atom? Yes. Can an element be a molecule? Yes. Yes, it can, right? So an element can be an atom. An element can also be a molecule. When an atom, I'm sorry, when an element is a molecule, Right? That means that it has two or more of the same atom stuck together. The most common example of this would be what are called di atomic excuse me diatomic elements god my handwriting is getting worse by the second so die what does die mean two, two right yes and atomic meaning atoms right so an example of a diatomic element would be oxygen which always exists as oxygen, the atomic symbol here, and two of them connected together, okay? We'll get more into detail about that as we get into chapter two. Um, cool, so we have elements that can be atoms or molecules, right? Then we have compounds. What is a compound? Um, a compound is a combination of two or more different elements of atoms. That's correct. So you have two or more different flavors of atoms stuck together, right? Mm -hmm. So can a molecule be a compound? Yeah. Yes. Are all compounds molecules? No. No. Yeah, I think so. Wait. Mm -mm. Right, so molecules can have only the same flavor or they can be a mixture, right? So they go both ways. Compounds have to have a mixture. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we have compounds and we have molecules. I'm gonna get... you asked if all compounds are molecules, not if all molecules were compounds. Uh, the, so just because something can go one direction doesn't mean that it's bi-directional. Well, yes, I just, I thought I, 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 I guess I thought I heard you say that all, well, ask if all compounds are molecules, which, whatever. Yes, all compounds are molecules. Yeah, I agree. 
So we have molecules uh, underneath the, the category of molecules. We have elements, right? And we have compounds, right? And under compounds, we just have compounds. Does that make sense? Questions? Cool. So, whether we're talking about compounds, molecules, elements, or atoms, whoops, compounds, molecules, elements, these are all different forms of pure substances. Okay, pure substances. I apologize if sometimes my words get disconnected looking um, because I'm I'm writing and looking at the screen, <laughs> so it's kind of difficult for me to keep my handwriting nice, but, but I'll do my best. Um, so, all of these would be considered pure substances, right? So we talked about some examples, right? We have oxygen, right, as O2 would be an example of a pure substance. We have, um, what would be another example? Nitrogen, sure. Dioxide? This is dioxide. Oh. Yes, you're already naming things. You're killing it. <laughs> what else? How about gold? That would be a pure substance, right? Unless it's mixed with something else. How about uh, this guy? What's this guy called? That is carbon dioxide. That's right, carbon dioxide, right? So, carbon dioxide, molecule, question mark? Uh-huh. Can you get an example of something that's like not a pure substance? Yeah, we're, like... gonna, we're gonna get there, yeah. But molecule? Would that also be a compound? It is also a compound, exactly. Right? Is it an element? No. Right? Is everybody comfortable with that? Yes. So these guys are all elements. This guy is a compound. I'm going to get lazy and start abbreviating things here, guys. So. A pure substance can only be made of one type of substance. Right? And again, substance here includes elements, molecules, and compounds. Right? Sorry about that, guys. So, substances does not mean only one kind of atom. That's the important distinction here. So you can have a pure substance that's made of more than one flavor of atom. Right? but it has to be combined into one compound. Does that make sense? You guys tracking live? Questions about that? <laughs> Sorry that you guys get to read my text feed. Even if I put it on mute, it's still on. Um, cool. So that's a pure substance, and then we have mixture, which I think was what it was it Yvonne you were asking about? Yeah. So a mixture, so if a pure substance is uh, made of only one type of substance, what do you figure a mixture is? Um, 
combination? Yeah, it's made of two or more different pure substances. Right? So, what are some of your favorite mixtures? I mean, it's the same thing, but, but yeah. How about I give you an example of mine? It's one that I can't consume right now because I'm pregnant. <laughs> yeah, booze, right? Booze would be an example of a mixture. So uh, you have water is the main component, and then you have ethyl alcohol is another one of the components. There's probably a lot more stuff in there too, but that would be an example of a mixture. Does that make sense, guys? So what do you guys think? What other mixtures do you like? Huh? Kool-Aid and water. What's that? Kool-Aid and water. Kool-Aid, sure, yeah. Kool-Aid's great. Peanut butter and jelly, fantastic, love it. Lemonade, totally. I think when we think mixtures, we tend to gravitate towards liquids, right? But um, but what other phases do we have? Yeah. Solid and gas. Solids and gases, right? So the peanut butter and jelly fits into the solid category, right? How about some gas mixtures you guys like? Gasoline. Hopefully, no. No, and that's actually a misnomer. It's actually not a gas, right? It's a liquid, generally. I mean, it's definitely readily vaporized, but how about, uh, how about air, right? What's air made of? Oxygen and nitrogen. Yeah, so we've got oxygen and we've got nitrogen. Those are the two main components. Um, I think a lot of students are surprised by this, but about how much of the air we breathe is oxygen? 80? Oh no, baby, you'd be so high. 20? You'd be so high if it was 80. <laughs> <laughs> right? So we have uh, the oxygen that we breathe is about 20%. Um, I'm sorry, the air that we breathe is about 20% oxygen and about 80% nitrogen, right? Um, yeah, go ahead, Danielle. Oh, no, no, no. Oh. I was just cheering because I said 20% in my head and I was cheering <laughs> You're doing myself. It. You're doing it. Um, so, so yeah, but this is a common misconception. If, uh, uh, if air was made up completely of oxygen, first of all, we'd be high all the time. Extremely high, right? So, have you guys ever had to be on oxygen for any reason? Like, medically? That's great. Yeah couple people yeah I have so uh, what happens when you're on when you're hooked up to the oxygen machine it helps you breathe better yeah but what does it feel like oh floating it feels like you're you're like you're kind of floating it feels like you're lightheaded exactly right yeah so so this is um, not something that we experience on a daily basis right so thankfully um, if the if the atmosphere was made completely of oxygen, um, we would be probably different life forms, right? What's the other important reason why having the air be completely composed of oxygen would be very bad? Oxygen burns, doesn't it? Yes. Oxygen is the main component in combustion, right? So if you don't want the entire planet to catch on fire, having a limited supply of oxygen is probably good for your atmosphere. Does that make sense, guys? cool. Nitrogen is inert, so it's a gas that doesn't really do much, so it's not harming us. It's just kind of hanging out, right? Um, so this is totally tangential, but I think it's an important point to relate into um, our current COVID uh, times that we live in. So I don't know if you guys have uh, had a friend or a colleague or someone 
say that uh, the masks make it um, too difficult to breathe, right? Um, or that you're somehow inhaling your own toxins. Have you guys heard yeah. this line? Yeah. Yeah, so um, what do they mean by toxins? The carbon dioxide that we expel when we exhale. Yeah, yeah, look at those people, Miguel. So they, I, I think generally uh, we, can, we can be safe in saying that they're probably talking about carbon dioxide that we exhale, right? So um, when we breathe in, we breathe in 20% oxygen approximately, right? And about 80% nitrogen. So when we breathe out, are we breathing out 80% nitrogen and 20% carbon dioxide? No way, right? So respiration is not perfect. We don't convert all of the oxygen into carbon dioxide. On average, when we breathe out, we're exhaling, we're exhaling about 4% carbon dioxide, right? So this idea that we could somehow poison ourselves by having a mask on is pretty crazy. And also because the relative size of oxygen and carbon dioxide are pretty similar, right? So molecularly speaking, these guys are almost the exact same size, right? Um, so if oxygen can get in, then that means carbon dioxide can get out, right? So you can go ahead and explain this to your crazy aunt or uncle. Um, <laughs> I actually had to do that with a customer at Sprouts yesterday. Yeah. And out of the yeah, they, they, they don't want to know about it because they don't have, you know, any logical reasons to feel that way. But yeah, it's, it's common for people to have anxiety when their mouth is covered, right? That's totally a normal thing. But anxiety is not the same thing as um, actually experiencing toxicity. Um, so, so yeah. Anyways, fun, fun facts for COVID for fighting uh, misinformation on the internet. So it's, it's not about, um, so scrubbers are designed to, um, to pick up particular kinds of molecules. So this gets into more um, dealing with intermolecular forces and how we can force things to, to, to do what we want molecularly, right? And that's chemistry. But when we're just talking about simple respiration, we're not doing anything special, right? All we're doing is inhaling and exhaling, right? So is there a chance that there's some minor um, uh, accumulation of carbon dioxide? Maybe, right? But if that was the case, then after an hour or two of wearing a mask, then people would start to hyperventilate, right? And I, you know, while some people may hyperventilate literally as soon as they put them on because they're again experiencing anxiety, um, that's not, that's not typified, right? So you have a surgeon can perform surgery with a mask on for eight hours. People in the hospital are wearing them for 12 hours, right? So we know conclusively that, that that's, that's not harmful, right? If there was, we would see long-term effects from the people who wear them on a daily basis. So, but interesting arguments, right? This is understanding chemistry the world, it's life. Cool, okay, so we have pure substances versus mixtures. I'm gonna erase. So now we have two basic flavors of mixtures. Mixtures, whoops. So our two flavors of mixtures we have are Heterogeneous. Oh, somebody's at the hospital. We're gonna mute you. There you go. All set. <laughs> Participants, mute. Oh. I'm sure she doesn't want to hear, or he doesn't want to see here about his doctor's visit. Um. Okay. Sorry. Come here. There we go, cool. 
So we have a heterogeneous mixture is one type, and we have a homogeneous. is our other type, right? So hetero, our root word here, means different. And homogeneous, homo means, oops, same, right? So if we have a mixture is always going to be composed of two or more substances. A heterogeneous mixture will have non-uniform composition throughout. So, what do you think that means for our homogeneous mixture? Uniform, Uniform right? So, it will have uniform composition. Composition throughout. Feel free to let me know if I spell things incorrectly, guys, because like I've previously mentioned, I have no idea how to spell, so it's probably going to be a common thing. Um, okay, so what the heck does that mean? So, to give you an example of a homogeneous mixture that has uniform composition throughout, vodka, right? Vodka is a mixture, it has water, it has ethyl alcohol, right? Uh, but can you tell the difference between where the alcohol and the water are? No. No. And that's because it has uniform composition throughout. Does that make sense? Coolsies? So an example of a heterogeneous mixture would be something like oil and water, right? Or uh, salad dressing. Some salad dressings, not all. Right? So you have a bottle of salad dressing. If you, assuming you guys eat salads occasionally. Um, the salad dressing bottle, when you go to use it, is separated into different layers. Right? And you got to shake it, shake it, shake it to get those layers to kind of sort of mix. Right? But it's a very temporary kind of mixing. Right? That's a heterogeneous mixture. You have non-uniform composition, meaning that there's clear separation of the components, right? Um, yes. Wait, so, um, since mixtures can also be solid, wouldn't basically every mixture of multiple solid objects be um, heterogeneous? Is so. So, uh, in the main, I would say yes. However. One of the main solid solutions that's homogeneous would be an alloy. So um, steel, oh, uh -huh. brass, any kind of mixture of metals in that sense is going to be a homogeneous mixture. If you're talking about I thought solutions and sorry, good, that's okay. I thought solutions and mixtures were different things, and alloy is solution. Uh, so a solution is a type of homogeneous mixture. Oh, okay. Mhm. Mm yeah. No. So you're 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 already you're already getting into the to the material ahead. Yeah. You're killing it. Does that make sense, guys? So uh, again, homogeneous just is referring to the fact that uh, the composition is uniform throughout. Meaning, um, in order to separate these, it would be um, some. It would be quite difficult, right? These guys are combined. Um, uh, very thoroughly, as it were, right? But if we had something like sand and 
Oh, well, that's kind of a misnomer. Let's say sand and metal, right? Sand and some metal. Um, unless they were fused together homogeneously, right? Then this would be an example of a heterogeneous mixture. P, B, and J, homogeneous, heterogeneous. Heterogeneous. Air. Homogeneous, heterogeneous. Homogeneous. Homogeneous, right? So you can't tell the difference between where the oxygen is and the nitrogen, right? Thankfully, otherwise we would be in grave danger. <laughs> Does that make sense, guys? Yes. Questions about that? So, things that you're going to want to know for the exam, right? You're going to want to know that a pure substance is anything that's made of one type of substance. A substance can be a compound, an element, or a molecule, right? But it can only be one of those things. A mixture is two or more pure substances. If those two substances mix together uniformly throughout, we say the mixture is homogeneous. It's a homogeneous mixture. If the two pure substances that are mixed together or more are um, non-uniform throughout, then we say the mixture is heterogeneous. Everyone cool with me on that? Mm -hmm. Questions? So, you should be able to, um, to define the difference between a heterogeneous and a homogeneous solution, right? And ideally, given some type of example like this, oil and water, vodka, right, something like this, you should be able to tell me whether that mixture would be homogeneous or heterogeneous, okay? Questions about that? Okay, if I erase. All right, so the next thing we want to talk about very briefly, and you guys are going to get into this um, this week in lab, are measurements. Mm, I can try again. Measurements. Right? So one of the big... Oh, I'm sorry, you guys. <laughs> okay, come on. You can do it. You can do it, camera. Oh my God, focus. <laughs> this is so annoying. There we go. Okay, I'm thinking about getting a new phone because this becomes problematic. <laughs> like the new phones can do better than this, right? Um, okay, so measurements. Um, what are the main things that separates chemistry from a lot of other um, disciplines, especially math, um, is that generally when we're doing math, we're doing math with real quantities, right? So what do I mean by real quantities? So in math, we do a lot of things with numbers, right? Are numbers real? Kind of, right? But when when do they become really real? When it's one plus one. How about when we stick a unit to it, right? So when we talk about things like one plus one, we're talking about math in the abstract, right? But when we're talking about chemistry, we're always talking about amounts of things, right? So we're talking about length, we're talking about temperature, we're talking about all of these things that have units, right? And that makes these things quantifiable, right? 
You guys comfortable with what I mean by quantifiable? It's basically just a fancy way of saying I can measure it, right? Measurable? Is that how you spell that? Maybe? Looks right. <laughs> I don't know. Cool. Um, so, so yeah, so this is, I, I mean, none, neither of these are small words, right? But quantifiable is just a fancy way of saying I can measure it. Um, so when we talk about measurements, right, they always have two components, right? So a measurement will always have a numerical component or a number. Right? And it will always have a unit. Right? Now, this may seem kind of mundane, but I don't think that we do a lot in in other subjects to differentiate between this idea of um, math in a numerical sense and measurement math, right? So measurements always have a unit and they always have a numerical component. You can't measure something without having a unit. So if I were to say, uh, hey guys, do you want to walk 10? What would you say to me? 10 what, right? Because I'm guessing your answer would be very different if I said 10 years versus 10 minutes versus 10 steps versus 10 miles, right? All of these are going to elicit very different answers from you guys. So um, units are tremendously important when we're talking about chemical quantities, right? So forever, for the rest of your life, now that we started into dimensional analysis, units, 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 units. Literally every time you take a quiz or an exam, write this at the top of your scratch paper, right? Um, you will lose points if you forget the units, I promise, okay? Um, and that's not because I'm being a jerk, it's because now, more than ever, those units are imperative, right? They matter. Um, if you don't have the unit, then you do not have the full answer, okay? So, units, units, units. So, when we make a measurement, are we always 100% certain of the numerical component? No. No. Absolutely not, right? So um, we know that there are some tools that can give us really, really good measurements, right? A good measurement, whoops, is called a precise measurement, right? So when we talk about measurement, uh, the better the measurement, the more precise the measurement, right? Now what determines that precision? Technically, yes, but I'm thinking more um, like physically, what determines that? Your measuring device? Your measuring device, exactly, right? So different measuring devices, different tools will have different precisions. So the amount or the degree of precision in your measurement is only as good as the instrument. used for the measurement. Mm -hmm. Right? So, 
If we know that we can't be 100% sure of any measurement, then what that implies is that measurements always always include error, right? Measurements always include error. The amount of error that they include is dependent on the instrument, right? So the better the instrument, the less error the measurement has, right? Now, functionally, what that means is usually more precision means more digits, often decimal places. Right? So, how do we quantify that precision in our measurements? That's where we get into significant figures. Significant figures are the topic for the lab this week, right? I'm not going to get into it too much in lecture because you're never going to need to use significant figures for me, um, but you do need to see them so that you understand how precision is conveyed in uh, measurements, right? So, long story short, more digis means more precision, right? In some cases, there may be more digits before the decimal, depending on the size of the measurement. In some cases, it may be more after the decimal, right? So you have a very, very small measurement, right? Then your precision would be in having more decimal places. If you have a very, very big measurement, large measurement, then your precision would be in having more digits out front of the decimal, right? Is everybody tracking with me? Cool. So, I'm not even going to write down the word sig figs here, <laughs> but you will hear that um, in lab, right? I, sorry, I abbreviated. Significant figures, aka sig figs, aka siggy figgies. That's just me, though. Nobody else calls them that. Um, but, but yeah, just so you guys are familiar with that terminology. Cool, questions about measurement and precision. Beep, boop, beep. Here I was thinking it was fortunate. Oh yeah, we definitely have stoichiometry, but you won't need to know all of the uh, significant figure rules that force you to say, this is how many decimal places I should have in my answer. You're basically just gonna be rounding for fun. So, coolsies, questions about measurements. So, things you should know. Measurements always have two components. Those two components are units and a numerical component. Um, measurements always include some amount of error. The less error, the more precise the measurement. The error is dependent on the instrument that you use, right? So better instrument, higher quality instrument, more precise measurement, crappier instrument, less precise measurement, right? Coolsies? Questions? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. I do have a question. What is a higher quality instrument? What would that be considered? So it usually has to do with um, getting you more digits in your measurement, right? So specifically when you're talking about um, lab stuff, you'll get into different types of instruments. So one of the instruments that we use a lot is the analytical balance, right? and an analytical balance.
as precision to 0 0.0001 grams, which is the same as saying that you can get four decimal places, right? Now I'm guessing the uh, scale, if you even have a scale at home, right, that you have at home maybe has Sorry, LBs, right? Something like this, 0.1 pound. Yeah. If, you have, if you have a kitchen scale, it probably goes to plus or minus one gram. You might be able to get a half a gram out of that bad mamma jamma, depending on if you have a fancy one, right? So basically, what makes a good instrument or a bad instrument? Dollar, dollar bills, y'all. Right? The, the better the instrument, the more money it costs. Okay. Got mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, generally speaking, when you're baking, you probably don't need an analytical balance, right? It's uh, more precision than you would need, so you wouldn't pay for that precision, right? When you're in the kitchen, a kitchen scale will do, right? Plus or minus one gram or a half a gram, that'll do the trick, right? Um, so it really depends on what you're doing and the level of precision required, right? Great questions, all of these. Any other questions? Cool. So the one other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, temperature. Temperature. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, spelling phonetically. Still doing it. My toddler's learning how to do it right now, and I'm still doing it at 35. So, um, so we talked about temperature um, in in terms of units. Right, we said um, I'm gonna I'm gonna spell this terribly. Fahrenheit. I don't know how to spell Fahrenheit, you guys. It's something weird like that. There's a weird H. No? Anybody want to chime in on that for me? <laughs> Correct. Huh? I'm close. I'm in the ballpark. Whatever. So Fahrenheit is the one that we're most familiar with. It's stupid and we're never going to use it. So get out of here, Fahrenheit. Um, the uh, scale that we will use most often will be Celsius, which is abbreviated with the degree C. Right? Does anybody know what this temperature scale is based on? Water. Uh Melting and boiling mm -hmm. water. So the zero degrees Celsius is the uh, freezing point. Of water, right? And 100 degrees Celsius is the boiling point of water. Right, so Celsius as a temperature scale is based on the freezing point and the boiling point of water, right? The other scale that we have that we will use, um, especially when we get into chapter eight, when we get into gases, is called Kelvin, which is represented by Daddy K. This is a Daddy C, by the way, too kind of hard to see in my handwriting, but this is Daddy C and Daddy K. Um, Kelvin is what's called an absolute temperature scale. Okay, so what does that mean? So can we have negative temperatures in degrees Celsius? Sure can, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. So there are plenty of places on this planet that are negative degrees Celsius. Not a comfortable place to be, but it definitely exists. Is there such a thing as negative Kelvin? No. no. Is there such a thing as zero degrees Kelvin? Yes. Hypothetically. Rarely. But physically, no. Right? So the idea of an absolute temperature scale is you are basing your temperature, as it were, on the uh, motion of the molecules or the energy of the molecules that you're measuring, right? Higher temperature means more motion, right? Is there such a thing as zero molecular or atomic motion? Theoretically. Theoretically, but physically, no. Right? So you can get things moving so slowly that there is no apparent motion, right? Um, certainly to our eyes, that's not difficult to do. But to uh, take away all energy from molecules completely is theoretically not possible, right? So Kelvin as an absolute temperature scale can never be zero. It approaches zero asymptotically. What does that mean? You guys heard that term before? An asymptote? So mathematically, an asymptote, so if you've got your line, right, you can get um, asymptotic behavior when it comes really, really close to the boundaries but doesn't cross them, right? That's what asymptotic behavior is. Now, I didn't draw it very well, but that's getting infinitely closer, <laughs> right? I can't draw that and make it look like they're not crossing because I'm not skilled enough to do that, but there are plenty of pictures on the internet if you want to look up asymptotic behavior. Um, it'll show you a much prettier picture than that one. Does that make sense, though? So we can approach zero, but we never actually get there. Coolsies? Questions? Yay! We did it! That's chapter one.